Yes, the next issue we're going to talk about is on physical federalism. What does this physical federalism entail as far as federalism is concerned? Physical federalism has to do with the way and manner the federal government, the state government and local government share its national resources. Now, there are various sources of government revenue. Before now, government revenue was basically sourced from uh, agriculture. In other words, agriculture was the mainstay of Nigerian economy. But with the gradual transition and the discovery of oil, there was a sort of change of paradigm. What does this change of paradigm entail? Agriculture that used to be the mainstay of the nation's economy was relegated to the background, and oil was considered the New Deal. As a result of oil exploration, as a result of continued activities of companies that are into oil exploration, especially in the Niger Delta area, it has created a lot of trouble. Now, one of such or the consequences of the operation of the uh, oil industries or oil companies in the Niger Delta is the fact that it has created oil spillage. As a result of the continued exploration of oil in the area, the water part or water area, talking about the sea or the riverine areas, that used to be one of the major sources of the indigenous income. The people in the Niger Delta area predominantly uh, participate into agriculture or fishing, as the case may be. Now, this, as a result of this oil spillage, the water system has been polluted, and now the, the aquatic animal in the, in the sea or waterways died up, and some of the water that got towards the area or the hinterland or the areas that are not waterlogged eventually become barren because this exploration, the chemical that comes out with it, is so strong that it made the land to be infertile and can no longer grow any crop. Now, as a result of the need for a federal government to have some sort of uh, bargaining uh, mechanism where the resources that it has accrued from various areas, mining, talk about other non-oil sectors, for example, mining, talking about the IGR, talking about taxes and all of those things. These are areas where the government sources its revenue. And at the end of the day, when the revenue is sourced, it is expected that it, is, it should be directed to a particular account, that is, the, 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 the Federation's account. At the end of every month, all the component units or states will have a share from the total amount that has been realized for the month. Now, the Nigerian federal uh, revenue allocation experience have actually uh, Underwent or undergone uh, various phases. From the time where uh, resources in Nigeria was allocated on certain basis to a time where the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has categorically recognized the basis upon which Nigeria resources shall be allocated between the federal government, the state government, and the local government. Now, there are basic issues as far as Nigerian federal allocation or revenue allocation experience is concerned. First and foremost, as a result of the continued exploration of oil in the Niger Delta area, it was recognized that there is the need for derivation. And this derivation principle entails that 13% of the total accruals from the Niger Delta area shall be sent back to the host community for development and to ensure that the people in that area were given adequate attention so that their ab initio, uh, what they do to earn a living in life, basically agriculture and fishing, at least now that the waterway is polluted and the land is also polluted, 
the government should be able to provide the people with the opportunity to earn a decent livelihood. Now, the next is uh, the national development principles. The national development principle ensures that all the states of the Federation have equal access in terms of siting of developmental projects. Now, the, the sixth geopolitical zone in the country is, is expected to have a, a split of federal uh, government projects. And as this project is being uh, executed, it is expected that at the end of the day, such federal projects will have a direct impact in the life of the people in the community, in that very community, or in the concerned community. The next principle that guides and determines federal allocation in Nigeria is the principle of equality. This principle of equality entails that all the compact federation or all the federal or members of the federal compact, talking about the states, have equal access to the resources that has been accrued. Now, when you talk about equality, that can be misleading. In the sense that if we are saying equality, all states must have equal access and equal resources from the Federation's account, it means that we are not putting into cognizance the fact that there are states that are economically viable and the states that are economically viable produces more and they contribute more to the national coffers. And by that, it entails that what they are going to have in return should automatically be, uh, you know, uh, 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 relatively uh, uh, an improved of what other states that are economically non-viable, that are economically uh, non-viable. To put it in another way, states that contribute more are expected to earn more, while the states that contribute less are, of course, expected. Uh, to contribute less. And that is the same way it goes. Now, the next principle that determines federal allocation in the, in the Nigerian federal system is equality population. You will realize that some states are populated, are extremely or densely populated, while other states are scanty, you know, you have a scanty population. And by that, it entails that states that have higher number of population are expected to be considered more than the states that do not necessarily have these resources, or th this population. Now, in this particular realm, what the federal government does is to ensure that siting of projects and carrying out of certain developmental initiative in states that are populous or populated to ensure that these states benefit more because of the demand of the population. For example, states like Portacos, Kano, Kaduna, and Abia, for example, are states that are densely populated. And by this, it requires that the government must act accordingly in citing of projects and ensuring that during national emergencies, these states are not allowed to degenerate or to be allowed to risk the population it has. Perhaps that's the reason why during the corona break, states that are considered populous, the rate at which the virus expands is more and higher in number compared to states that have a lesser population. Now, the next principle that guides Nigerian federal system or Nigerian federal uh, fiscal federalism is landmark and geography. The landmark of a state 
is one major determining factor of what she gets from the Federation. There are states that as a result of the nature of geography they have, they have access or they are blessed with certain mineral resources and that these mineral resources, if properly harnessed and manned and appropriated the way it should, it will indeed increase the level of the state's IDR and not only that, it will provide an enabling environment for the state to be able to have a fair share during the distribution of uh, uh, the national cake as it is usually called. Now, the next is absorptive principle and IGR. In this case, IGR entails the internally generated revenue and what this entails is basically the ability for the state or for the component state within the federal system to be able to raise the needed resources internally to complement the federal allocation they receive on a monthly basis. Now, when we to make a quick uh, uh, reverse of some of the discussion, especially the principles of uh, derivation. We initially started a discussion of uh, the consequences of the activities of uh, the oil companies that are located in the Niger Delta area. And that there is always a memorandum of understanding that is usually signed between the community or leaders of the community and most of these oil companies. That some of the co corporate social responsibilities that they are going to carry out will be geared towards ameliorating the pain the people have been subjected to. And by this, it entails that the people will be able to have some succor or some form of relief such that their whatever thing they have lost as a result of the oil activities of the oil explorer, exploration, at least they have uh, something that will be given to them in return. The Niger Delta experience did not only provide this, or the Nigerian federal, fiscal federalism did not only provide a derivation principle. There were other efforts by successive administration that is geared towards providing solution to the crisis in the Niger Delta. And one of such efforts by the past administration is the creation of the Niger Delta uh, Commission. The Niger Delta Commission was created under uh, President, uh, former President Olusegun Obasanjo on, with a specific mandate. And that mandate is to ensure that it complements the activities of the states in the area of developmental infrastructure. But today, what we have seen is that the Niger Delta has, you know, been transformed to a cash cow where people go in there, secure contracts, and at the end of the day, they are given some percentage. Sometimes they are given 100% of the money. And at the end of the day, these projects or contracts are not executed. The recent National Assembly probe on the Niger Delta Development Commission was a direct reflection of what is happening in that particular agency, where the individual that is expected to manage the corporation or organization is handicap of the explanation on the whereabout of certain amount of money that has been you know, expended under his leadership. And immediately after that particular incident, nobody hears about that particular proof or the outcome of the proof. I'm specifically talking about the chairman of N uh, Niger Delta Development Commission. And if this kind of attitude or characters will be allowed to continue to head 
sensitive corporations or agencies of this magnitude, certainly Nigeria will continue to wallow in poverty, deprivation, and backwardness. Successive administration under President, late President Yaradua thought that there was also another need for government to see to the cries of the Niger Delta people. And immediately, the government, under his leadership, sweep into action. One of the major policies or breakthrough of that particular administration was in the area of the creation of a specific ministry that is expected to handle various projects in the Niger Delta area. And not only that, the youth that has been terrorizing communities, the youth that have been deprived and alienated from their community as a result of the activities of oil exploration, they have considered or they were granted amnesty, and not only that, the weapons and light weapons as well as uh, 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 powerful or bigger weapons that they have in stock were at least sometimes was given to them to be able to return these weapons and then go back to the table for negotiation and understanding. A good number of them complied. But in spite of the creation of this particular ministry and the amnesty granted by the Niger Delta people, today there is still some element of alienation. There is still some element of cry for marginalization. And there is still some element of leaders not willing to be able to discharge their responsibility. So it is high time for the Niger Delta people to realize that their problem is actually not the government any longer. Their problem is the nature of their leadership. Because if you want to look critically on the nature of intervention or government interventions that have been taking place or that have taken place in the past, most times these interventions are being handled by people from that very community. There's always this feeling that people that come from a particular community that is having a particular problem are in the best position to prefer a solution and to chart a new cause for such, uh, you know, a cause for that particular community or society. But at the end of the day, we end up or ended up being disappointed. Perhaps at this juncture, we might recommend that in subsequent government intervention, people from another region should be elected or should be appointed to heed to head certain corporations to ensure that uh, there is uh, accountability, there is uh, transparency and service delivery to the people. Now, we will quickly uh, look at the uh, next session and the next session has to do with uh, a comparative aspect. We are going to have some sort of uh, element of comparison between Nigeria and United States of America. Now we're look at, going to look at the strengths of uh, the federal system in Nigeria and that of Singapore. Uh, we'll also look at their weaknesses and uh, prospects. First and foremost, uh, one of the strengths of the uh, uh, Nigerian federal system is the fact that, uh, according to Bala Osman, uh, so many scholars have argued that the Nigerian or the, the, the amalgamation between the Northern and Southern Protectorate in 1914 was a historical mistake. Contrary to this particular perspective, uh, what we have experienced so far is the fact that the uh, Nigerian federal system, in spite of the challenges it is facing, has continued uh, to, 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 to exist and has continued to flourish. And this, according to uh, Bala Osman, is a plus and Nigeria stands to be a model in Africa. Now, uh, in area of strength also, one of the strengths of federal system is that it ensures cohesion. There is unity in diversity and people will have the opportunity or they have the sense that 
their opportunity their expectations and hope will actually uh, be considered especially in the area of policy formulation and uh, implementation one of the uh, weakness of uh, federalism is that there is always political tension especially in countries that are not actually complying with the principle of federal system in other words countries that do not accommodate uh, various multi-ethnic multi-religious multilingual as well as all other components of a federal system such community or countries are bound to always witness political tensions and there is always crisis of marginalization at any point in time in the history of countries that do not comply or do not to try as much as they can to ensure that the federal principle or federal system that is in operation caters for the needs of the federating unit there is always going to be the cry for marginalization because the community or state or the component unit that felt not being adequately catered for would always want to seize every opportunity to express their sadness and in some situations at least to chaos and uh, in, the, in, in the aftermath of it lives and property worth millions are lost so uh, it is a call for nations that practice federal system to ensure that uh, people that are located within their various uh, community or various states are adequately uh, provided with their needs now in terms of uh, differences between Nigeria's federal system and Singaporean federal system. Basically, in Nigeria, for example, the constitution recognized that uh, uh, adult age from the age of 18 and above, uh, they are the ones that are eligible to participate or to express their universal, universal adult suffrage. In other words, they are the ones that are recognized to participate in elections. People that are below 18 are considered to be minors uh, and they are, uh, they are felt uh, not in the proper position to take certain decisions for themselves. But for Singapore, uh, the electoral age or the age for universal adult suffrage is 23. Basically, and uh, elections is a matter of compulsion in Singapore. People are expected to come out in their mass to participate in elections and unlike the Nigerian federal system where a good section of communities and societies will prefer to express, you know, uh, they, 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 they might want to not to participate in electoral activities because of the failures they have been experiencing. So they, they will express uh, political apathy. And as a result, most of decisions that will be taken or the votes that will determine the outcome of elections, they are not part of it. And this is not really healthy for a federal system. Another aspect of a federal system or difference between Nigeria and, and uh, Singaporean federal system is the fact that Nigeria operates uh, a, a bicameral legislature where we have uh, the upper chamber and the lower chamber, talking about the Senate and House of Representatives, unlike that of Singapore where it is uh, a unicameral, a unicameral legislature where the legislature, you know, uh, is just a single body, unlike it's just a single house. And uh, in Singapore, an individual can be part of executive and at the same time part of uh, legislature. You will wonder how can such individual perform his duties or how can there be checks and balances? Now, federal ministers in Singapore sometimes 
are part and parcel members of uh, the legislatures. They make laws and ensure that they check the executives. Now, how they do it basically is this, that there is a specific time they allocate to uh, legislative duties, and there are times that they allocate for uh, executive duties. They, they, uh, as, as a federal minister in Singapore, uh, you, you are entitled to certain uh, benefits and uh, the same thing with uh, that of Nigeria. The only difference in the area of uh, what they earn, basically, is the fact that uh, Nigerian legislature, or an average Nigerian legislature, earns higher than uh, virtually most legislatures in the world. So uh, perhaps this could be an area where we may have to uh, review or possibly begin to ask a question that for, 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 for the years we have been as a nation, Nigeria has expended a huge sum of money maintaining its legislative, uh, 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 legislative body. So in, in, in a democratic system and in view of the reality of our time, where most economics are actually, uh, economists are facing, uh, you know, uh, uh, turmoil, and there is a gradual dwindling in resources worldwide. It, it is a call for the nations to re-examine uh, its uh, multi or, or, or uh, its, 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 its bicameral uh, legislative principle or legislative bodies uh, with a view of ensuring that uh, uh, the expenses or the huge amount being uh, appropriated for this particular body in carrying out their responsibility is caught so that uh, these resources can be saved to uh, fund certain developmental projects and policy. The prospect for the countries is the fact that both countries have actually uh, uh, had a form of historical uh, trajectories, especially in their experiences and federalism. What we will say basically is the fact that uh, federalism in Singapore have actually yielded a far better result than what is obtainable in Nigeria, even though the nature of leadership in Singapore is not really what is obtainable in Nigeria. But our argument is always that irrespective of the nature of leadership system that is in practice, the ultimate thing we should work towards is to ensure that an average Nigerian have this sense of belonging that he or she is a citizen of the country and not only that he believe that whatever decision the government is going to take it's going to take it in the interest of the citizenry so i believe uh, as time goes on we will hope that uh, the government will see the need to begin to reassess uh, certain practices within its federal system uh, with a view of strengthening the federal character, federal system, and to douse the recurring tensions and cry for marginalization. Thank you very much, and God bless.